Hello, welcome to the Emotional Resilience Video Toolbox, episode two of seven, related to acceptance commitment theory. In each of the videos that I'm doing related to ACT, I'm gonna present a few broad, big picture ideas about the theory, and then focus specifically on one of the six core concepts that are included in the theory. So today, what I wanted to share with you um, related to the overall kind of big picture of ACT is um, the main goals of the acceptance commitment theory, accepting what is and committing to take uh, value-guided action, acceptance commitment theory or therapy. Um, and the aim of ACT is to help you accept what is out of your personal control while committing to value-guided action that will improve your quality of work or life or move the situation in the direction that's most lined up with your core values. Uh, the goal is to create a rich, full, and meaningful life while effectively handling the pain and stress that life inevitably brings. Um, we're not interested in chasing shiny, sparkly, happy moments. Um, uh, those are nice when we get them, but instead of chasing those, we would be relaxed, very clear about our values, and uh, honoring the things that make our heart sing and lining up our action with our values and therefore feeling really content. When you're lined up with your values and your life matches that, there's a feeling of contentment that's very grounding. We want to be more able more often to live your life lined up with those core values. Now, the real starting point for acceptance commitment theory challenges what's known as the happiness trap or the happy or the myths of happiness. Um, a lot of the material in this presentation comes from the book, The Happiness Trap, uh, How to Stop Struggling and Start Living by a doctor named Russ Harris. Um, and one of the things he starts out with is really challenging this idea because we think happy is normal. The, the myths of happiness include that happy is normal, ha happy, healthy is happy. If you're not healthy, something's wrong with you and uh, you should be able to do something to fix it yourself. So it puts us in this struggle with whenever we're not happy. But it's kind of based on the idea that happiness is normal. And the research doesn't, doesn't bear that out. So here's some things to think about. In any given year, 30% of the adult population will suffer from a recognized psychological disorder. A whole lot more of us uh, are, have symptoms of those disorders, but maybe don't qualify for the actual label of that disorder. According to the World Health Organization, depression is currently the fourth biggest costliest and most debilitating disease in the world and estimates that by the year 2020, it'll be the second biggest. Uh, what I would want to say about that is anxiety is rapidly increasing as the uh, most prevalent uh, mental health concern uh, for adults. In any given week, one in 10 percent, one in 10 of the world's population is suffering from depression. One in four adults will suffer at some point in their life with drug and alcohol addiction. One in two people will go through a stage in their life when they seriously consider suicide and will struggle with it for a period of two weeks or more. And finally, one in 10 people actually attempt to kill themselves. One in 10, one in 10 people. So the researchers that wrote a book called the Acceptance Commitment Therapies Handbook, which you can link to here below, uh, say this, if we add up all those humans who are or have been depressed, addicted, anxious, angry, self-destructive, alienated, worried, compulsive, workaholic, insecure, painfully shy, divorced, avoidant of intimacy and, and stressed, we are compelled to reach a startling conclusion, namely, that psychological suffering is a basic characteristic of human life. And because of those myths of happiness, we get pulled into our struggle uh, more than we need to. So really, if you experience these types of thoughts and have these types of feelings and, and behaviors, you're pretty darn normal. Uh, one, in, one in two people have considered uh, killing themselves. That's 50%. And in my, in my estimation, 50% is, is, is pretty normal. The trouble with this is that 
we don't recognize these things as part of the human condition and we don't teach skills to you know help people navigate those thoughts and feelings and experiences in fact what we teach people actually causes them to get bigger and and to have more of those experiences and and as a result we're struggling and suffering so recognizing these things as part of the human condition and learning some basic skills can have you less have you have less of these experiences so in the first video I, I asked folks to print this uh, diagram out and to um, complete it by looking at each of the six points and um, determining whether they were more like the sentence on the outside of the diagram or the sentence on the inside of the diagram and, and asking people to uh, mark somewhere on the scales where they're at. So today, uh, I'm going to, after a brief review of what each of the skills are, we're going to focus on this one right here, this observing self, also sometimes known as the witness self. We want to be waking up the witness. That's the very first part of becoming psychologically flexible is we have to wake up the part of us that can notice what we're creating with our psychological gifts. So the six core concepts, just to go over them, is the skill of connecting or connection is allowing you to put your psychological attention uh, to the here and now, bringing your attention to the present moment. If you were to bring all of your attention to the sound of my voice, to how you're currently sitting in the chair, to what the light in the room looks like, um, these would be examples of helping yourself connect with the present moment. Typically, we spend a great deal of time either in the fearful future thinking or past uh, already happened thinking. Um, and connection it helps us come to the present moment. Uh, diffusion is what helps you um, when you recognize that you're really gripped by or attached to or have been hijacked by a thought. The skill of diffusion is what gives you some space between you and the thought you're holding and so that that thought can dissipate. Um, you cannot practice diffusion if your observing self doesn't notice that you're fused in the first place. Um, expansion is uh, noticing the emotions that you're having and where they're at in your body and just instead of resisting and trying to avoid difficult emotions, we open up and make room for them so that they can come and they can inform us however they want to inform us and then they can go. Uh, expansion is sometimes uh, referred to as acceptance. The observing self, which we're talking about today, is the part of the mind that's able to be aware of whatever you are thinking or doing or feeling in the moment. It's what allows you to go from just being a character in a play, bumping into other people without direction, to being in the audience able to direct your character on the stage in a way that makes wise sense. Um, sometimes that's referred to as perspective taking. Uh, the values are kind of really getting clear about what you want your life to be about, like the big picture, and committed action is your ability to take action lined up with those values. So today we're focusing on the observing self, and Eckhart Tolle, who wrote the book The Power of Now, uh, was a, is, a, is a brilliant man and had a great deal of education, uh, as it was an engineer, uh, very math and science oriented, spoke several languages, a brilliant mind, um, and also a mind completely caught up in struggle. And at one point he was very suicidal and he was, and he, and he was saying to himself, I can't stand me, I can't stand myself, I can't stand me. And all of a sudden he had an insight that there must be two of him. Uh, he said, there's the I that can't tolerate the me. There must be two of me. And that insight shifted everything in his life. And he started realizing that he wasn't his thought habits and he wasn't the story he was creating and he wasn't the psychological struggle. He was the entity creating and holding that struggle. And it allowed him to break free of all that he had been creating uh, and uh, he, woke up his, he woke up his observing self. Um, so there's two of us. So your thinking self is sometimes referred to as your ego. Uh, I, I refer to it as, your, as my reactive self or my occupied self. That it's the part of me that when, when I get caught up in my thinking, it's what, I, it's what I'm creating inside those 
uh, thought stores. I, also, I often talk about shopping and thought, we, sh we shop in thought stores. And so when I'm in uh, an overwhelmed thought store, my reactive self or my ego or my thinking self is overwhelmed. But there's a bigger, broader, vaster part of me, my observing self, that is not currently overwhelmed. It's the part that can notice that I'm overwhelmed and that's the part that can call me back home. So your thinking self is your habit self, your, your conditioned self. We often refer to that as being on autopilot. So maybe we're in a low mood and we're kind of tired and we're driving down the road and someone cuts us off. And we have a really strong thought of, hey, you can't do that to me. And we flip into this reactive self and, um, and engage with the situation from that vantage point when our observing self, which is more value guided, might like care about our safety or the fact that we have a small child in the car and would not do that same reactive behavior. Autopilot is when you um, are not even really aware of what your thinking self is thinking and you, you maybe drive home and you don't even realize um, how you got there. And that's because you were, your, your autopilot self drove you home and you weren't actually very awake on, while driving. So your observing self is this other part of you, sometimes referred to as your witness. Um, in mindfulness practice, they talk a great deal about waking up the witness. Um, some folks call it your soul. Uh, Eckhart Tolle uses the word essence, your human essence or your being, your beingness. Uh, I often refer to my true self um, as opposed to my reactive self. My true self is very grounded in my values and my reactive self departs from those values on occasion, gratefully less than she used to. Um, Melissa Etheridge, one of the lyrics from one of her songs, goes, my, my window through which nothing hides and everything sees. And I've always thought that was a great description of your observing self, that you can see what you're up to. If I asked you right now to let your observing self notice your mood, uh, you could probably give me an assessment of your mood. If I asked your observing self to notice um, uh, whether or not you're cold, you could probably tell me what your kind of body temperature is. Your observing self, if, if asked, can like comment and notice uh, about anything. You could notice how uh, your body is making contact with whatever you're sitting on right now, and your observing self could notice that. Really, I think that of your observing self is your capacity to direct your attention uh, somewhere where you want it to go. Why is waking up the observing self so, so important? Well, our condition responses are not often helpful. They're often habitual or reactionary. And um, in those moments, our thoughts kind of hijack us and, and uh, our, be our behavior can be seriously uh, altered or impacted by that. Um, our autopilot lacks wisdom and creativity. Uh, a lot of times our thinking self goes with what it already knows. It's processing. It's trying to uh, calculate and figure things out but it's not necessarily open to new ideas, uh, to insight, um, so it can be kind of stale. Uh, so the, one of the most important reasons that it's important to wake up your observing self and to even know you have one and to start living there from a greater percentage of the time is that you have to notice you're fused with the thought before you can diffuse it. And we get some very um, insecure, fear-based, scarcity-oriented, dangerous thoughts in our heads sometimes. And if they come into our head and we start participating with them and get caught up in that thought store and we don't even know we're shopping in there, we're at risk of buying what that store sells, which can be really dangerous. And that's the reason why people relapse, even though they really want to be in recovery, is they get fused with thinking that they're not good enough. Maybe they go shopping in the shame store um, or the uh, nobody cares about me store. And in there, the, there are thoughts that encourage behavior that would cause a relapse. So if your observing self doesn't notice that you just wandered into that thought store, then you're going to be at risk, uh, and you're going to be at risk there. Um, you can, and um, a great deal of psychological suffering is caused from resisting what is? So we make a plan and we decide to go with this plan. It's a great plan. Everybody thinks it's a great plan. And then something happens and the plan changes. And, and, and then the plan becomes no longer viable. Uh, but you get so resistant, 
about your plan not being viable that you stay in that state of resistance and you're just mad and upset and resistance. If you don't notice that you're resisting something that already is, you're going to be in a state of resistance and struggle way longer than is helpful. And one of the, uh, one of the Boulder by Design ideas is that we need to be, um, we need to respond nimbly when challenges occur. And um, I never really got, got why that was in our mission statement, but now I get it that if you, um, if you can't respond nimbly and quickly and, adap and adaptively um, if you spend a lot of time resisting uh, and you don't notice the resistance and shift towards creativity quicker. So waking up your observing self can help you skip the resistance part and just get to the creative problem solving part. And that is so helpful, both at work and at home. Our witness self can direct our psychological attention. That's a different way of saying our witness self can help us not terrorize ourselves with our own fearful thinking. And so if my witness self notices that I'm remembering a scary movie that I saw and I'm making up this big story and image in my head that I'm not safe in my own home, uh, if I notice that my witness self can help me uh, focus on my breath, uh, uh, connect with a friend, um, take a nap, it can, it can help me do so much more than just being stuck in that thought world. Our witness self is the only one that can ever really help us. So we can see that a, a loved one of ours perhaps is really caught up in shame-based thinking and, and really hurting themselves with self-criticism. And we can want to take those thoughts away from them we can try to help them understand how their thinking works. We can invite them to watch this video with us, for example, but we can't open up their head and take their thinking out. Um, they have to see that they have thinking that's not uh, a real truthful or helpful, um, or at least is not the only thought they could have. It's not until a person sees their own thinking that they can help themselves interrupt these really unhelpful habits. Again, your witness self or your observing self can direct your attention just like you could direct a flashlight. Sometimes something grabs our attention and we're all of a sudden illuminating some worst case scenario thought and um, we can hang out there for, you know, half an hour before even realizing that we've been like totally illuminating uh, a worst case scenario that's likely to never happen. If our witness self notices that by noticing our body, our tension, um, we can actually uh, direct that attention onto something else. As a way of breaking the connection with the scary thought, you're now putting your attention on helping, on noticing your blood, your um, heart rate drop. You can notice uh, the movement of walking as you take a walk away from your desk for a minute to allow yourself to settle. Your observing self can help you physiologically settle. You can't control your thinking, and when people notice that they're attached with thinking, their first reaction is to try to make themselves not think that thought. And when you do that, like what you resist persists. You cannot, uh, you know, you cannot make yourself, like if you're having anxious thoughts, you can't make yourself not have those thoughts. Um, the harder you try to not, to not have those thoughts, the more you're going to have them, because you're still giving your attention to those thoughts. You're still invested in that struggle. Uh, your observing self knows it, that it's not about your thinking, it's about where you direct your attention. So you allow your attention to be directed to someone else. An example of waking up your observing self was that I was talking with a wonderful teacher and she was getting really caught up and overwhelmed by the core curriculum requirements that all the pressure um, to like teachers have to do all these things in their hour and sometimes she just gets so overwhelmed and mad because she's not just teaching anymore. She's trying to think about all these requirements and she'll just get really caught up in her head. Um, and I, I was encouraging her when she noticed herself spinning like that, that I wanted her just to sit down in her chair or on her desk for a minute. And I wanted her to bring her attention to one of the students in her class and really, really observe them for a moment. Like just really take them in. And she tried this on and she would share with me these delighted um, observations of the unique uh, fourth graders that she had and how uh, they were, you know, working so hard on their paper and blowing their bangs up uh, 
trying as they concentrated. So what, for a brief moment when she observed one of these kids and allowed herself to relax, it cleared her mind. And then she would ask herself, what's most important to do in the time that I have remaining? And then she would do whatever her wisdom said. So this bringing her attention to one of the kids allowed her to detach from the thinking that she was overwhelmed and angry and could never get it done and was just failing. She would reconnect with her health and well-being, and then she would do a wise thing. And what the kids didn't get was uh, more of the upset, overwhelmed, irritated, and sometimes cranky teacher. And what they got more of was her wise, generous spirit that was grounded and teaching. And that doesn't mean that the structures that she was up against were made any sense. It just meant there was a, there's a better way to navigate whatever you're going through, and your observing self can help you figure that out. Um, between now and the next video, I'd like you just to be working to wake up the witness as you go about your ordinary daily life. Um, washing the dishes is just one example of many where if you allow yourself to wash the dishes very awake, you would bring all of your sensory attention to the, the act uh, and task of doing the dishes. And so you'd be very mindfully aware of the heat of the water, the, the suds, the feel of the suds, the smell of the soap that you might be using. You might pick up just one dish at a time and wash that. And as it goes from dirty to clean, you might notice the light uh, changing in, in the water on the plate and you would set it down beside you. Um, if you're going to do the dishes anyway, to do dishes in a very overwhelmed, resentful, upset, resistant state of mind is exhausting. If you wash the dis dishes awake, you get the dishes done, and you also have a restful, energy-producing moment. Waking up the witness and allowing your witness to guide you through your day helps you not waste your energy in ways that aren't essential. And so it's actually a personal energy conservation strategy as well. I just want you to simply start noticing, what am I making up right now? Ask yourself these questions. Or what am I feeling right now? What's my thinking self up to? Um, am I resisting something? Uh, you get points for noticing. You don't get points for having perfect thoughts. And one of the things I would say is if, if you're wanting to start noticing and dropping resistance, you're gonna notice yourself doing it more. It's important not to judge yourself when you recognize you've been caught up in a thought store. You wanna think of it more like you're driving down the highway with an intention to relax and stay in your lane. And sometimes you drift to the side and you hit the rumble strips. You know, I always wanna thank the people that put those in the road because they, they save so many lives. And so when you notice yourself getting resistant and tense or upset or stressed or whatever you want to call it, uh, all you really want to do is come back into your lane and relax. You want to notice and gently self-correct by releasing the thought and bringing your attention to the here and now. So if you were driving, you would actually bring your attention to how you're sitting in the seat, how your hands are on the steering wheel. You might notice that you're rushing and you might allow yourself to physically and psychologically relax back into your body and just become very aware of your driving um, as an example. So I just want you to simply start noticing. Notice and gently self-correct. So I wanna thank you for being part of the second episode. And in the next episode, we will talk about connecting with the present moment and allowing your attention to come to the here and now and why that's important. Thanks for watching, and we'll look forward to our next time together.